GPD. Er, 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 Batman GPD, by the way. <laughs> Fuck. Whatever, Mix Master Mike. <laughs> Batman GCPD. We're getting ready to hit it here. This is the Source Material Comics Podcast. I'm Jesse Starcher. That over there is Mark Radlich. And we're sticking around talking more of those characters that hang around with Batman. Don't be fooled. Batman, I think, is in this comic for a quick second. Quick second. <laughs> One panel. What are you doing here, Batman? A very brief cameo. Yes. Yes. And GCPD, we're going to cover this a little bit differently, Mark. Okay. So, so be ready because what I'm going to do, there are four issues. And this was written again by Chuck Dixon, art by Jim Aparo and Bill Sienkiewicz. Bill Sienkiewicz is inking things, Mark. You remember Bill Sienkiewicz from the Demon Bear Saga? God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where he was inking with a giant house paintbrush. <laughs> I think he might have been straight up artist on that thing. I'd have to look and double check and make sure. This one's Jim Aparo, who's a very his, good. He, Jim Aparo is a well known Batman. His genitalia in in the inkwell <laughs> and smeared it on the paper and went demon bear. <laughs> The only thing that would have made that worth is Jeffrey Keith. Oh, yes. Jeffrey Keith. <laughs> Scott Keith. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Keith. you you tune right in and listen to uh, me, Derry, and Dean talk about Claws and Webs, which is just straight up Sam Keith. And he's doing Venom. He's doing Wolverine. So first, I think... I really first, hate I really hate Keith Richards as an artist. Oh, uh, well, poor... <laughs> Gosh, but, but anyway, so I was on I was on movies that don't suck and some that do. And they were reading movie quotes. We had to guess which movie the movies were from. And so I couldn't figure out which one of them. So I started going Watchmen. We were a dead of extraordinary gentleman. <laughs> they had no idea. They <laughs> yeah. probably had no clue. Yeah, I had to explain uh, what the fuck. I was like, do you have Tourette's? No, it's a gag. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guys. <laughs> they don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> Uh, but yes, Bill Sienkiewicz on inks in this one. Jim Aparo, though, very well-known Batman artist. So that's why you were probably okay with some of what you were reading here and didn't mm -hmm. be, you weren't like, oh my gosh, what demon bear shit hold did this climb out of? <laughs> Bill, Bill Sienkiewicz was just inking Jim Aparo, which is great. But we're going to do this one a little different. There are four issues to this story, Batman GCPD, but there's four different tales. So I'm going to stick with each individual tale. Okay. All right. Well, let me open up things because the, the opening kind of stands out on its own. And then what we're going to do is we'll talk about Bullock's story, Harvey Bullock's story. We'll mm -hmm. talk about Kitch and Kaz. I didn't get Kaz's first name. I don't even know if it's said. We'll talk about their story. And then we'll talk a little bit about, I guess there's only three here, Montoya's story that happens throughout this. So let's open things up here. You said open it up. So I'm starting to watch, but uh, okay, you do that in the gritty streets of Gotham. The relentless pursuit of justice makes an intense. No, oh, it takes an intense turn as Sergeant Harvey Bullock and detective Renee Montoya find themselves on the tail of the enigmatic costumed villain known as the dot or the polka dot man. I, I don't know if he's changed his name, but he calls himself the dot here. The air is thick with tension as the duo moves in to apprehend this elusive foe. However, chaos erupts when Harvey, driven by a personal vendetta, he's, he's taking it out on the guy because the polka dot man injured one of the responding officers, unleashes a torrent of extreme justice upon the dot, utilizing the villain's own bat to deliver a beating that resonates through the darkened alleys. As the blows rain down, Montoya, the voice of reason in this chaotic dance, steps in to rein in the overzealous partner. Her stern admonishment echoes through the night, a stark reminder of the fine line they tread in their pursuit of justice. In the aftermath, Montoya, rear wearied by the unorthodox methods of Bullock, seeks respite through a transfer. She wants out. Her plea, however, falls on deaf ears as the request is denied. Undeterred, Montoya finds herself reassigned to a new team, thrust into the shadows of a kidnapping investigation that promises to unveil a different kind of darkness lurking within the city's underbelly. The relentless dance between law and disorder continues, each step taken, leaving an indelible mark on the streets of Gotham. So that's kind of how we open this story. Harvey Bullock goes off, beats the crap out of the dot, breaks his arm, <laughs> and then... Montoya's like, I can't handle this guy anymore. I've been partners with this guy for so long. He is always beating the crap out of people. I'm afraid he's going to go off. Get me away from this guy. And so they do. Harvey and Renee Montoya are separated into two different teams at this point. So that's kind of how we open things. Harvey's mild racism cracks me up. <laughs> I didn't order Chinese food. 
<laughs> like I'm oh, Korean. Well. <laughs> <laughs> See, he just reminds me of like Bunk and Lester. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> boogie, woogie, 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 you motherfucker. <laughs> Uh, RV Bullock. So he gets partnered with a Korean guy, and he's like, "I don't want you." We're gonna call him everything, definitely... everything but like a slant dive motherfucker. And the Korean <laughs> guy's like, "Look, I, I'm here to civilize you, you caveman." Yes, yes. Please, can we just get through this investigation? So, okay. Now, you mentioned already before before I get into Bullock's story here. You mentioned how Harvey Bullock is. He's definitely got a bit of a reputation about him. <laughs> I've been reading Batman comics with you and without you for years now, and he comes up a lot. He does. Okay. All right. So Renee Montoya, how about her? She what's funny is actually my my most outstanding memory of Renee Montoya is from the Injustice comic where, where she takes the uh, the super pill and hulks out. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, I don't remember that. Oh my goodness. Uh, she was oh, on wow. Batman's team and she loses her mind. Oh she's up. Uh, Harvey and Renee are kind of presented as the yin, the yin and the yang, the the angel and the devil of the Gotham City Police. It's it's two different perspectives. You have the one person kind of representing the the ideal. This is what all cops should aspire to be: a Puerto Rican woman. What you shouldn't be is a fat white guy. That's pretty much what they're telling us now. <laughs> Ray Montoya is the ideal. She does things by the book. She is one of these people enforcing the law in the way that law should be enforced. And you have Harvey Bullock who's cynical, who is war weary, who has lost faith in the system because the system fails to solve the problems plagued by persistent criminal activity. And so Harvey sort of no longer respecting the institution for which he is employed kind of goes outside the lines and is frequently having to be reined back in lest he completely cross the line and become the people he's trying to put behind bars. But Harvey would tell you that an eye for an eye is what's right. Might makes right. And the fact that he has to brutalize people like the polka dot man, it's it's the argument with the Joker, where how many times are you going to let the Joker out so he can kill more people? Why don't you just shoot him? Isn't that, isn't, isn't that the good work? Aren't we saving people by killing this one guy? If you're going to make an omelet, you got to crack a few eggs. That's where Harvey's coming from a lot of times. It's he, <laughs> Harvey is one of these people who like, the cops are just the most bestest people ever. And Batman changed them. Batman, the, the Batman's existence is the tacit recognition the cops can't get the job done. Mm. And that is a direct insult to Harvey, who believe cops are angels sent from God to do his work. <laughs> right. <laughs> so therein lies the conflict. And then he's not crazy about Jim Gordon either, because he feels like he respects Gordon, but then Gordon allows Batman to exist. And so by logic, that makes Gordon bad. Why do you let this piece of shit in a clown suit do what he wants? Why right. Don't just, why don't we shoot him? Right. Uh, and again, why don't you just let me do what I want to do? I'm doing the I'm doing the Lord's work mm -hmm. where Harvey's coming from. And that's where a lot of attention and conflict rises. Well, so Bullock is kind of definitely getting some scrutiny here now because Renee has shown a light on some of the unfortunate things that Harvey does. So let's talk about Bullock's story here. I want to read it read the synopsis for him, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about what happened there. In the labyrinthine world of Gotham's law enforcement, Sergeant Harvey Bullock finds himself entangled in a web of brutality complaints. Indifference. Like <laughs> <laughs> indifference and an unexpected partnership the air of apathy surrounding bullock is palpable as polka dot man files a grievous brutality complaint against him an accusation that slides off bullock's hardened exterior with disdain all i can think about is the wire now season two <laughs> it's, it's, fuck you this ain't the choir or whatever it was <laughs> he says <laughs> Fate takes a turn when Detective Kevin Soong becomes Bullock's new partner, bringing a fresh perspective to the grim tableau. That's another thing Chad GBT likes to say. Their grim first tableau. assignment. I once saw grim tableau open up for Metallica in 1989 at the Nassau Coliseum. <laughs> that's that's great. <laughs> <laughs> there probably is a fan named Grim Tableau. <laughs> I would bet money and lose. <laughs> Their first assignment plunges them into the heart of a macabre homicide investigation a chilling pattern emerging where victims receive teddy bears before meeting their demise i just the, want to be your teddy, teddy bear, bear. it's a weird a big fat guy with a beard says that to you <laughs> <laughs> the investigation takes a haunting twist as soon discloses a dark facet of his past his last three partners met untimely deaths while he survived as the duo delves deeper into the ominous puzzle another victim falls prey an artist marked by a teddy bear and a fatal shot Simultaneously, Bullock faces internal affairs hearing 
his unyielding attitude leading to a recommendation for a psychiatric evaluation. Despondent and betrayed, Bullock reaches out to Montoya, finding solace only in her answering machine. Soon, deter undeterred by the shadows cast upon Bullock, arrives with a breakthrough. The victims share a connection through a sperm bank. Do you share a connection with the sperm bank, Mark Radlich? <laughs> well, these victims do. <laughs> the pursuit of clues. I share a leads... connection with a certain someone who I dumped my sperm into. Okay, all right then. <laughs> I filled her with so much man -seeing. Oh, boy. The Look, pursuit of that is your fault. I you know. did this. I did that. I did. I I welcomed that onto this podcast. You certainly look. You knelt down in front of me. You opened up and said, "Ah, you can't." <laughs> then cry. What came out of me on top of you? Oh no. <laughs> oh no. The pursuit of clues lead them to the cop named <laughs> Mister. How, how was your podcast tonight, Jesse? Let me tell you about oh, my friend. Mark. I'd rather no. I'd rather not talk about it. Actually, that's the, that's the answer. <laughs> I'd rather not talk about it. Uh, the pursuit of clues leads them to a cop named Mr. Auerbach, but they arrive too late with this thing. Get it an hour back. Get it hour back. Oh, play back in an hour. Afraid not. He's dead. Hey, Jesse, oh. your, your, your plot synopsis is taking an hour. Back. Get it. Hour back. Uh, hour back. Oh, my gosh. They arrive too late, witnessing the murder's escape. Soon Valiant, in per soon, Valiant in pursuit jumps and breaks his leg, the criminal slipping away. Undeterred, though, Soon proposes a new approach, reaching out to the recipients of the donor. Meanwhile, Bullock reluctantly attends therapy reluctantly for sure resistant to the introspection it demands the investigation takes a crucial turn when soon and bullock interview the mothers unraveling a lead though through mrs wilkins whose facade begins to crumble under some scrutiny over coffee soon unveils the personal struggles he conquered through therapy establishing a bond with bullock that transcends the case at hand the duo decides to probe deeper into the wilkins's affairs unaware that the darkness they seek hot hides behind a facade of normalcy returning home bullock discovers a teddy bear ominously re resembling himself a sinister gesture that sends shivers down his spine accusations fly within the gcpd walls but the truth remains elusive soon and bullock grapple with the conflicting evidence about mrs wilkins only to unearth a heartbreaking revelation a sick baby a tragic loss and a shattered couple seeking vengeance. The climactic confrontation unfolds as Mrs. Wilkins' husband, armed and enraged, targets Bullock. In a selfless act of heroism, Soong takes the bullets meant for Bullock, sacrificing himself to give his partner the chance to eliminate the threat. In the aftermath, Soong lies wounded in the hospital. The motive behind Wilkins' descent into darkness is unveiled. A tale of jealousy, stalking, and a broken dream that led to a breaking point. So there you go. That's Bullock's story right there. So... Mm -hmm. What do you think of that one? Uh, this this was told throughout all four issues. We get Harvey, who is clearly he's despondent. It says that in the, in the synopsis here, but he's upset that Renee left him. And and well, it's, then it's a shaming thing. As long as she's willing to tolerate his oafish behavior, he can he can justify it in his own mind. The minute here's the thing: if you and your wife, if you're if you're behaving in a way where your wife is like Jesse, I don't really like what you're doing, but she stays with you. There's always the that there's always that sort of reconciling. Well, my behavior can't be that bad. She won't leave. Mm. But if she does leave, you have to then reflect on the things that you've done and go, maybe it was worse than maybe I am as bad as she yeah, says. Maybe I, am. I shouldn't have done that. And that's Harvey's thing with with Renee. As long as she stays, he can reconcile in his own mind. Well, I can't be. She's just whining. She's just being a whiny broad. But but she leaves, and then it's like, oh, I guess maybe I am a shitty cop. But I don't want to be a shitty cop. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to change either. Right. I don't want to. Keep, I don't want to stop what I'm doing. I just want you to validate the choices that I'm making. Yeah. Which is a lot of people. I think one of the reasons why I like this story, especially better than the first one, is Harvey's a very relatable character for a, in a lot of ways. I think he's a lot of. Again, I don't want to change my shitty behavior. I just want you to tell my tell me that my shitty behavior is okay. Mm. And when you won't do it and I respect you, it becomes a matter of, well, now I have to face the hard decision of accepting I'm a shitty person and I should change or accept the fact that my, I'm a shitty person, but be okay with it. Right. Well, I sort of own it. You know what I mean? And then a lot of people, it's funny, not to beat this particular dead horse, but I watched Barbie last night with my girlfriend and there's a lot of stuff that's sort of poking at typical male behavior in that movie. I don't know if you've seen it yet. Not yet. Uh, Ugh, you're like the only one but you have to have you have to be able to laugh at yourself in order to appreciate some of what that movie is saying about men mm -hmm. it is definitely taking some jabs at at silly male behavior 
I think you can either be the man that leans into it and goes, we are kind of dumb like that. You, you, you got us, Greta. Good on you. Score one for the girls. <laughs> or you can do what some other people have done, which is get upset that men in any way were criticized and then retaliate. And it's like, I don't see where that where the latter does anyone any good. Mm-hmm. I think having the ability to self-reflect and admit that we're kind of goofy creatures and we do some dumb things is okay. And maybe we change some of those things. Maybe we don't. But I think at least recognizing it is a good first step. And you right. have people that won't even do that much. So that's what I was saying about Harvey at the top of the podcast, the other story. Cops are infallible, angels sent from God who never do any wrong. Okay, well, that's not altogether true. Yes, but the minute I start to agree with you that it's not altogether true and we do fuck up some things, I immediately have to reflect on my own behavior and realize what a bag of shit I am. Mm. And I don't have the ego integrity to do that. Yeah. And that's Harvey Bullock for you. Watching Harvey kind of go through i'm going to call it a transformation but he definitely he learns some stuff here throughout this little story Mm -hmm. and you we also learn a lot about harvey too because i like that they wrote him as as a complicated human being and not just he's not one note he he kind of I think about like the, the 89 Batman, the way that the character is done there, where he's a caricature. He walks on the scene, there's like a dead body on the ground. He's like, ah, clearly he was drinking Drano. <laughs> you know, he's just, what, what, what's my character? Corrupt cop. What's my motivation? Corrupt cop. There's nothing more to him. It's so funny because comic books have this reputation for being like dopey kid magazines, but this is some of the better writing I've seen in terms of dramatization and characterization. They made Harvey, who sometimes, depending on who's handling him, a little on the one notice side, again, the 89 Batman. And here, he's a very complex individual. He, you can't pigeonhole him into one kind of character type. Right, right. And watching him be paired up with the Korean partner, you, <laughs> you're just waiting for him to sabotage that whole thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that was very cliche, by the way. I don't need no damn goddamn partner. It's like, <laughs> but you do. Come back, Harvey. Come back. <laughs> and then there's those couple points throughout the, the book. There's that one point where he's soon as like, I'm... I'm you called me partner. This is the second time you've called me partner. So you're you're kind of watching Harvey grow a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing. I think he's an old man. He's he's an older guy on the force, and they stuck him with the with the Puerto Rican broad, and he just gets used to her and comfortable with her. And it's now we're gonna change you to this Korean fella. He's like, I don't like change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, even if there was no other element to it, it's just literally I don't like change. My partner is Montoya. I'm old, and I don't and I don't want to have to learn new people. Right? Because right. God knows I, mean, I can I can relate to that. Like we can, can I ever. Dude, don't know how much you have to work with people anymore because you work in a basement behind the door that says beware of the leopard. <laughs> but I at my job, we're constantly hiring new staff because we constantly have roles we have to fill. We also hire a lot of PRN staff. I don't even bother to learn these motherfuckers' names anymore. <laughs> they hi, I'm I don't care. We'll see how yeah. long you last. Yeah, I'll learn your I'll learn your name if you make it past, I don't know, three weeks. If I, if you're still here in six months, maybe I'll call you by your Christian name. <laughs> <laughs> we have nurses that come into booking you're like hi i'm rn so and so i don't give a fuck don't talk yeah. to me leave Put me the paper on my desk and leave me alone unless somebody is actively saying they're suicidal <laughs> and even then i would prefer you to just write me a note please <laughs> like i'm such Gosh. a dick but but i'm almost 50 i'm almost right. 50. i'm war weary i've seen a lot i've 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 Tired. experienced a lot i'm exhausted i'm out of patience with people right. harvey Harvey, that's right. I'm Harvey, Harvey Bullock. Bullock. All of this. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next story. This is Kitchen Kaz. Kitchen Kaz, not the kitchen, but it's Kitch and the Kaz. Please don't bring up the kitchen. Pat Mullen will cry. Oh, oh no. Oh boy. God, you remember that? I do remember. He was not he was not pleased with that adaptation. He was in any ready way. to burn down women and anyone that got in his way. <laughs> Detectives George Kitch and Kaz, and I don't remember his first name. Probably could have done some research and figured it out, but either way, it's Kaz. Find themselves entwined in a sinister is, web. Is he the human suplex machine? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> he will put you to sleep. <laughs> there you go. Sleep. <laughs> Oh, good stuff. (laughs) They find themselves entwined in a sinister web of violent heists, betrayal, and a surprising connection. Their investigation leads them to the doorstep of a dubious lawyer by the name of Melanshaw, a familiar face intertwined in Kitch's family ties. Not the show. Despite their history, (laughs) Melanshaw (laughs) <laughs> Melanshaw, Melanshaw remains tight-lipped, offering little insight into the criminal machinations at play. So, yes, again, this attorney, this this attorney is somehow involved or working with the insurance company. You might understand this a little bit more than I do, Mark. It's like they're stealing, 
and then buying back the stuff at half price. Which yeah, it's really less, cheap. Which is less than they would have paid to restock the shelves after reporting theft or something okay. along those lines. It's basically like they're scamming the system. Okay. So the stakes heighten when the news arrives that a man left comatose in the wake of a heist has succumbed to his energy. It- energies and injuries tensions tensions rise as kaz discovers melanchol's involvement a revelation that stirs personal discontent within the investigative duo a distressing call from the homicide department propels them back to melanchol seeking answers in the aftermath of another heist frustration boils over as melanchol refuses to aid their pursuit of justice prompting kitch's abrupt departure on the outskirts of gotham a twist of betrayal unfolds as one of the robbers meets a grisly end in gotham harbor betrayed by his own accomplice to untangle the intricate threads of this criminal underworld, Kitchen Kaz turned to an unlikely ally, Matches Malone, which have you ever heard of that name before? <laughs> I went to Matches Malone open up for Metallica in 1989 <laughs> at the Nasdaq Coliseum. Matches Malone is Bruce Wayne's alternative alternative criminal undercover identity. So when they punch the shit out of well, when they punch the shit out of Matches Malone. Mm-hmm. They're punching the shit out of Bruce Wayne. So nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I did not actually pick that up. Well, and and you, there's one panel where you see Batman swing away after they do that, and that's because Bruce Wayne is matches Malone, and he, I think it's Kitsch is like, man, he could take a punch <laughs> specifically because it's Batman. But anyway, so somehow they they meet up with matches Malone. And after a persuasive conversation, Matches reluctantly agrees to delve into the unfolding heist. And this is important, too, because the next thing that happens is they run into Commissioner Gordon and Gordon's like, why don't you check out Mickey Cortez or M- Mickey Cortez or Cortez, Cortez, something like that. I'll go with Cortez. But anyway, that's where I think Batman did some investigation and told Gordon about it. And Gordon tells these guys, why don't you check out this Cortez guy? Uh, so a raid on Cortez's home erupts in a fierce shootout, leaving Cortez clinging to life the puzzle pieces start to fall into place as kitsch pays a visit to melanchol unraveling cortese's final words a damning revelation that implicates melanchol as the mastermind behind the heists in a chilling confrontation melon and at melanchol's home the atmosphere thickens with tension melanchol exposed and corner draws a weapon on kitsch however loyalty prevails as kaz emerges gun drawn coming to kitsch's aid and sealing melanchol's fate the arrest of the once elusive mastermind be- brings a semblance of justice to the darkened streets of gotham so there you go that's kitsch and kaz which by the way I don't I I'm certain that these guys were probably in the Gotham Central stuff that we read, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember them for, at all. So Kitchen Kaz, I what do you think of this story? It's a high story. If you hadn't read that, I don't know if I would have remembered it. Matches Malone. Fair mm. enough. All yeah. right. <laughs> Sorry. Look, I spent a long time. I think I've done my part for for this particular book. I, I spent a long time talking about Harvey and Renee and everything. I was a good boy. I don't. This, this, the details of this particular story did not ring out to me. <laughs> All right. That's fine. That's fine. And it, it wasn't. It's more police drama stuff. There really isn't a whole lot that's yeah. happening there in their story. All right. And the final the final story that we get is Renee Montoya and her undercover operation infiltrating these kidnappers. Mm-hmm. So Detective Montoya finds herself plunged into a perilous mission to rescue the kidnapped wife of Amb- Ambassador Trujillo. The pursuit takes a treacherous turn when Montoya, in a fierce firefight, manages to save the ambassador's wife from the clutches of ruthless kidnappers. A black van serves as the escape vehicle, leaving only one criminal behind, a member of a clandestine group by the name of Cell 6, notorious for operating in the volatile region of Hasaragua. Been there a couple times. Shook my junk at it one time. <laughs> <laughs> In anger, you just like, whip your dick out like you kids. <laughs> uh, with a crucial lead in hand, Montoya's team devises a daring plan to lure out the remaining members of Cell Six. Montoya steps into the role of an undercover operative posing as the ambassador's wife, Basita. The day unfolds with diplomatic intricacies, revealing Ambassador Trujillo's unsavory character when he makes an inappropriate advance towards Montoya. As the stage meeting with another dignitary commences, the kidnappers strike again, snatching Montoya away. Despite the police's swift response, the kidnapper kidnappers elude capture, spiriting Montoya to an unknown, unknown location. Back at the station, Harvey is gripped with frustration upon learning of Montoya's abduction. Meanwhile, Montoya wakes up in captivity, her identity still concealed from the kidnappers who believe her to still to be 
Pasita. A harrowing revelation unfolds when the ambassador, unyielding in his stance, declares that negotiating with terrorists is not an option. Heard that before. Even if it means sacrificing, sacrificing Montoya for the cause of liberty. The kidnappers determined to manipulate public perception force Montoya to deliver a coerced videotape message, subjecting her to torture to enhance its authenticity. <laughs> to enhance this uh, authenticity. That's right. Frustrated by the <laughs> ambassador's unwillingness to compromise, Montoya's team intensifies their efforts to change Trujillo, Trujillo's speech. As Montoya battles hallucinations induced by her captivity, the situation grows increasingly dire. In a race against Tom, time, Montoya's hand escapes its restraints, albeit causing her to pass out from the pain. Amidst the mounting tension, Ambassador Trujillo, Trujillo receives a new tape and his callous decision to discard it before the police are aware angers Pasita. Meanwhile, Montoya, regaining consciousness, seizes a moment of opportunity when Ambassador Trujillo delivers his unyielding speech. Cell 6 realizes the grave consequences for Montoya, but in a daring act of defiance, Montoya surprises her captors, wresting control of a gun and turning the tables on her would-be executioners, marking a courageous triumph in the face of adversity. So Montoya, strong lady, strong yeah. character. I, I think other than the tendency to write her as a little not flawed, she's a little a little too Captain Marvel-y for my, for my taste. I think I think the story itself was good. I don't know. I wish he had more of an internal struggle. They do such a good job of writing Harvey and writing Jim. And then they get to Montoya and it's, well, she's a girl. And we know, and we all know girls are perfect. Okay. <laughs> so we weren't really going through what we're going through now, where we can't write women as fallible in any way, lest we, we pierce the, in their perfect veneer. But even, it feels like even back then, though, they could, her character is she's the, 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 the ray of shining light in the sea of darkness that is the Gotham City Police Department. Okay, well, what else? But she, but good people still struggle. Good people right. still have have a conscience that they're that they're wrestling with. Good people still make bad decisions. It's not you know, like she's sitting there w regretting the fact that she went out by herself. Right. And her her hallucinations is of Harvey. Uh, Harvey. Mm -hmm. Harvey kind of giving her a hard time, maybe spurring her on a little bit. But that's about mm -hmm. it. That's all I remember happening. She gets she passes Jesse's, back out. Jesse Starcher and Evan Bevins walk with the Jesus. We do. But even they, even they are prone to make a, a bad decision every once in a right. while. Right. That happens. Have a negative yeah. thought. Act in a way. That is maybe uncouth. Okay. And if Jesse Starcher and Evan Bevan to walk with Jesus, that's us. Kids struggle. We're pals. With, with, they play Marvel Snap. <laughs> you just see Jesus. <laughs> He's got a crazy combo. <laughs> Jesus comes off the cross and beats you with it. Not tonight, Pontius Pilot. <laughs> his, his deck is just completely full of Thanos, and I'm sitting there going, "Wait a second! Wow, well, wait!" Anyway, continue. Um, yes, my point is to be human is to have that ongoing struggle between doing what's right and doing what's wrong, but feels really, really good. And it never, they never seem to get there with Renee, and it's kind of annoying. Yeah, it's, it's some of the less good writing of these three stories not that the story itself is bad i think the story is solid but it she seems to be this almost avatar that you're supposed to project yourself into of godly perfection mm. and it's come on man this nobody knows anyone that's like this the yeah. best person amongst us the evan bevins and jesse starches of the world still have their struggles that's right that's right she didn't you know, seem to struggle too much right. i mean other I mean, than the fact she's just about to die but again it's not a that's not an emotional struggle as far as like right. That's not an internal struggle. That's a that's a that's a that's a outward struggle. Survival. A, right. Yeah, it's a situational struggle. And and I find that to be less interesting than someone's like an internal struggle. Right. I'm wondering how many people read this though and don't care. How many people read her and just like, oh, she's I don't know, she's also a girl, so who who knows? <laughs> uh, I li I would like the fact that she kicks so much ass and has no troubles, except that she's a girl and I where's Batman? The way that I look at this story, this GCPD, I mean, it's a way of mm -hmm. separating Montoya and Harvey Bullock. And then we're how are they going to fare us apart from each other and the rest of the That's GCPD? true, because the only thing that we usually have them do is show up to a scene that Batman's already been to. Right. <laughs> and there's Harvey. Rather, 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 Batman. <laughs> and there's Renoy. Oh, well, rather, 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 Batman. <laughs> So there may have been a struggle when, when giving them their own book and trying to figure out, like, well, what are we going to do with these people now? What do they do when they're not arguing about Batman's existence? Right. 
Right. Let's let's try and give them a little bit of something. Right. Something else to do and tell a story about the the GCPD. And I mean, it was fun story. I did. I left out the whole part about how they the internal affairs guy kept coming down there. And there was this other guy that kept talking about somebody was stealing the office supplies and he does the whole investigation. Then they end up finding out it's the internal. Oh, yeah. It's the internal affairs guy. (laughs) That actually legitimately cracked me up. Yeah. That was pretty funny. But, I mean, it was an all right book. I enjoyed this uh, for what it was. I, I, but I was it was really easy for me to look at it and go, oh, this is this is absolutely three different stories that were being told. And instead of putting it uh, each giving a title for the here's a Harvey Bullock one shot and here's a Renee Montoya one shot. We're just going to throw them into the GCPD and we'll tell we'll have the kitchen cas and then we'll we'll put it all sparsed out it, it kind of threw me actually for a little bit because when you're sitting there reading you change scenes and change different people you change settings and you change the characters without saying meanwhile or in the other part I'm of the city lie, i kind of struggled with that with the first two books there's a lot of characters and a lot of things happening kind of all over the place and i'm not kidding there was sometimes i i was kind of losing what the plot so listening to your plots and i was like oh that happened oh that happened oh that's interesting that happened <laughs> yeah it's easier for me to kind of key into some of the characterizations and the internal dramas than it is for me to comment on the overall story arcs, which I think yeah. does tell you a lot about the writing. Also, I tell you about the taste. David and I, when we, we've done a lot of TV parties together lately, and David and I are in two different places in our lives right now. He's about to have a baby. My marriage just blew up. So like, we're, we're just in two different places in life. There are things that I see and key into and that I reflect on and affect me that he recognizes but is not moved by and then there are things that he's keyed into and and recognizing and acknowledging and i go it i was not moved at all right that happens with robert too robert and i watch the same movie and i don't know if you know this about damn you hollywood we have vastly different viewing experiences <laughs> I've, I've listened to a show believe it or not <laughs> yes and there's, and there's alexis Haina who likes everything and we have to tell her she's wrong well, so <laughs> shatter her dreams we we, we tired of the saint andrews cross and we beat her <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> what? Oh, look, don't goodness. don't look at me like I'm some sort of pervert. It's not like I said we tie we tie her to the ground. And we pour hot wax on her. It's like no, I, I didn't, I didn't it's, say any of that. I'm it's, just look, uh, it's it's not like we shabarried her or anything like that. Just tied her up. And, tied now her I got to look that up. Now I have to look that up. <laughs> Please look it up with the children <laughs> present in the room. <laughs> I'll pass. <laughs> I'm gonna need you to Google image search Shabari. Oh my with goodness. the family watching with Mindy. No. Front and center. Uh-uh. Princess Mindy. <laughs> Princess Mindy. All right, let's get into plugs here, man. What's going on? All right, you can check me out on at Mark Radelich on TikTok. It's the only thing I care about at this point. Uh, I mean, Jesse's going to give you the rest of the plugs of where you can find our actual audio podcast. But really, who's listening to podcasts now? Who doesn't? Uh, we want those bite-sized little th- five-second right. hits. I saw a guy today <laughs> that his whole TikTok was a collection of his vines. And the caption read, I'm doing this until they bring vines back. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. I know that the uh, I know that the the most appropriate length of a podcast is 22 minutes. 22. What if we can get this done to 9 seconds? 9 seconds. <laughs> what if we can get our podcast whittled down to vines? I'm trying to think of what the synopsis would sound like 9 seconds it long. It takes Robert Winfrey 9 seconds to formulate a thought. <laughs> Let alone the whole podcast. Oh, man. Anyway, it took me more than nine seconds to fill up with a lot of semen, though. I'll tell you that much. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Just sitting there counting. One, one thousand. <laughs> two, one thousand. <laughs> Funniest thing I heard all weekend. It takes you old men so long to finish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's Listen, the way it is. I, I've heard enough stories about these young men who finish way too quickly. That's right. And then there's me, fall the time. <laughs> Take my time. Bring a sack of lunch. You're going to be here a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this all has to get left in, by the way. Somehow. Gosh. <laughs> anyway. Like, yeah. I'm at Mark Rattledge on TikTok. You can come see my family friendly karaoke, my spooky karaoke, my naked karaoke. Jesse. The new girl's not into the naked swimming, so I don't know what I'm going to do naked karaoke again. And I feel like the world has been robbed. Oh, well, the world has been robbed of your talents, huh? Yeah. Is that by, what the time, it is? by the time this airs, I will tell you that I will have done onesie karaoke. I'm going next weekend. I'm going to an adult onesie karaoke party at a bar in Largo. Wow. So I'm going to be in a big, I'm going to be a vegetable of some sort, like a yam or <laughs> possibly an eggplant. Yeah. I'm gonna be, this fat ass is going to be wearing a onesie <laughs> and I'm going to be singing karaoke. That's beautiful. Do you own a onesie? I bought one. 
He bought one for this I special event. I Next did not thing. buy. Now, when 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 people talk about onesies, they talk about footy pajamas or they talk right. about that's what I'm thinking. That's what the I'm kind thinking. of thing a furry would wear. Something with like a, that approximates the look of an animal. Okay. So like if you look on my Facebook page and you go to my events, you can see the picture that accompanies the adult onesie karaoke party and see what this get up this guy's wearing that invited oh, me to this. Oh boy. Yeah, buddy. So there was no way on earth I was wearing that. I have some oh, man. Pride. But I did, but, but I but I bought an adult onesie. It's basically a jogging suit that is a one piece instead of two pieces. Oh, all right then. With well, a that hood. Works. With well, a hood. That With that a hood. Works. So okay. I'm looking like a fat X Men. I oh, that's perfect. <laughs> I swell that's up like this. Perfect. <laughs> uh, well, so yeah, that'll be on that'll be on my TikTok at Mark Rattledge. Keep an eye out, ladies yep. and gentlemen. See my ki- you can see my son saying detachable penis at the family friendly karaoke at the Wabash Pizzeria and Ice Cream in Lakeland. Oh wow. And mortify a bunch of old people. They were like, time to get my pizza and leave. <laughs> He's like, why is this nine year old child? Well, as for myself. Do you ever do like strip snap? Do you lose never a, do you, strip you, snap. You lose a battle, you lose a shirt. <laughs> Don't do that, Mark. I'm afraid not. <laughs> I'm afraid not. You uh, ask him if he's into it. I, I, you know what? You ask Evan. I don't play yeah. Marvel Snap. Oh well, that's unfortunate. You need to, you need to pick up the phone and play some. Sometimes, listen. You can check out the Source Material Comics podcast. It is on the W Two M Network, and we have this show right here, Source Material. We also have the Unspoken Issues podcast, where we focus on '90s comics. That is out there, and of course, Snap Material with my buddy Evan Bevins, where we discuss Marvel Snap, that mobile card game that's taking the world by storm. So. Yeah. Check it and get, out and get naked. I mean, it's platonic, and, but they get naked. And get naked. Yes, that's. I keep forgetting to put that <coughs> on the plugs. I don't know why. All right, well, we're getting out of here. Then he comes down the stage. He's like, "Why are you naked, Jesse?" He's like, "Why aren't you?" <laughs> She doesn't have an answer for him. <laughs> uh, that's Mark Radulich over there. I'm Jesse Starcher. We're getting the hell out of here. Have a good one. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com, so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share, and we look forward to entertaining you again soon.